In this edition of Fix the Flick, we'll be looking at 2012's John Carter. The world of John Carter debuted nearly 100 years ago, and Disney did a great job of modernizing Edgar Rice Burroughs' sci-fi epic, and in some cases they even improved on the original source material. However, there were problems evident in the overall tone of the movie and the audience that it was going after. The books read like a mix between 300 and the first hour of Return of the Jedi, with a little Superman thrown in. Disney's version was a CGI spectacle that wasn't exciting enough for kids and not interesting enough for adults, and that was in part due to some uneven pacing and a main character that wasn't really likable. So let me tell you what I will do. I will break me out of this cell. I will claim my gold and get filthy rich. Rich enough to buy your flat, righteous blue behind. Just so I can kick it all day long. Instead of trying to cater to every demographic it could, the movie should have focused on a more adult audience. That way it could have stayed true to the story's original spirit, which has been widely popular since 1912. So with that in mind, let's try to fix John Carter. The opening narration introducing the audience to the idea of an atmospheric Mars was fine, but Mars shouldn't have been shown right off the bat. The moment we, the audience, first see Mars should be when the main character sees it for the first time, because it's his journey we're following. So we cut straight to Edgar inheriting John's house and all of his stuff. Edgar begins reading the journal, and because we need a more personal introduction to our main character before he goes to Mars, we first meet John Carter in Virginia during one of the final battles of the Civil War. We see that John has been fighting for a long time, and watching families torn apart by war weighs heavily on him. We start to understand why he's so world-weary, instead of just seeing an extra wedding ring on his finger and some quick, vague flashbacks. The battle has a much grittier, more realistic tone than the released movie. We actually get to see how good a fighter John is, instead of having a tragically wasted actor just tell us that he is. At some point, part of John's battalion gets cut off, and he goes to help them even though it's hopeless. We see that John can't resist evening the odds of an unfair fight. Despite John kicking some serious ass, they get slaughtered, and John is forced to retreat, something that he hates to do. Several months later, after the end of the war, John and his friend Powell are prospecting in the North Woods. But when they strike gold, they're attacked by some nasty locals. They escape by hiding in a nearby cave, and John discovers that Powell was shot in the chase, and he dies right there in John's arms. Now John's last real link to this world has been severed. We get to see this because this version isn't about discovering John's tragedy, but rather about him recovering from it. From there, things go pretty much the same as the original film. John shoots the Thern, finds the medallion, and gets transported to Mars. John then wakes up, and again, things go pretty much the same. Through trial and error, John learns to walk in the lesser gravity of Mars. He then hears the sounds of battle, and he goes to investigate. As he comes over a rise, we finally get to see Mars for the first time. And it should be fucking epic. But no time to gawk, because the sound John heard was two gigantic airships in a dogfight. One ship fires a blue ray gun, which we later learn is the ninth ray, at the other ship, and it crash lands nearly on top of John. He goes to the wreckage to look for survivors, and that's when he sees Dejah Thoris for the first time. He's blown away by her beauty, and she seems to feel the same about him. They look at each other as strange and exotic. John is about to introduce himself, but is interrupted by a horde of green aliens charging toward the wreckage. Trapped between the two enemies, John has no choice but to fight. He holds his own against a particularly imposing alien, but because he's not used to his newfound agility, the alien gets the upper hand and John gets captured. The warrior then orders a female named Sola to give him the magic language water, and the warrior introduces himself as Tars Tarkas of Thark. Tars then parades John through the streets, and the Tharks are just as interested in John as he is in them. He isn't so much a prisoner as he is an entertaining oddity. They then enter a huge amphitheater, arriving just as Dejah is having an audience with the Tharks' chief, Tal Hadjis. She describes some of the crimes the warlord Sab Than has committed against both of their people. She says that they could make strong allies and bring peace to Mars, a sentiment near and dear to John's heart. For a moment, the Tharks actually consider her offer of friendship, but an impatient Thark casually slaps her for his amusement and everybody laughs. But John's not laughing when he breaks his chains and leaps at the Thark, killing him with one blow. 
But instead of everyone attacking John, they're in awe of his strength. Tars immediately steps up and points out that he was the one who captured such a powerful warrior. We get the idea that John being recognized by Tars is some kind of power play against Tal Hadjus, and because Deja was the dead Thark's prisoner, she's now John's responsibility, and Sola is told to look after them both. Deja later asks where John is from, and when he tells her that he's from Earth, she tells him about the Therns and that they were said to travel between worlds. In this version, Deja isn't running away from marriage. She's searching for the Thern Sanctuary to learn about the Ninth Ray, and the airship battle with Sab Than trying to stop her. Like in the original, they go to the temple and they learn about the sanctuary on the River Is, and just like in the original, they get caught. But instead of Tars letting them escape, Tal Hadjus sentences all three of them to die in the arena, something that Tars is not at all happy about. But Tal Hadjus is happy to knock him down a peg. The fight in the arena pretty much plays out like it did in the released movie, except that there's only one white ape and it's 10 feet tall, not 20. Toning the scale down a little makes the danger feel a bit more realistic and not so cartoony. When John finally kills the ape, it falls on one of the arena doors, providing a way for them to escape. But Sola was injured in the fight and can't go on, so John goes back to get her, and they all escape through the tunnels under the arena. Now we cut away to Sab Than. He goes to his Thern temple and prays to a Thern named Matai Shang. Back in the cave, when John shoots the first Thern, it was back in the shadows and we don't really see what he shot. Same goes here. All we see is a dark robed figure with a creepy voice. Sab Than reports that Dejah Thoris was killed by the Tharks and that they have nothing to worry about. Matai Shang says that he better hope she's dead because if anyone else finds out about the Ninth Ray, they are going to kill the shit out of him. We see here that the Therns like to stay in the background and manipulate things from behind the scenes. We then cut back to our trio on their long journey to the Is. In this version, they all want to go there. John because he needs answers about what happened to him, Sola because she feels that she's failed Tars Tarkas, and Dejan wants to go there not because she's a spoiled princess running away from marriage, but a grown-up actively trying to save her people. The scene in the released film when they fight about going to Helium and not the Sanctuary felt contrived and the confrontation felt forced as a result. With the characters working toward the same goal, they have a chance to bond a little and the audience can get to know them better. This includes a scene where Sola reveals that Tars Tarkas is her father. By the time they reach the Thern Temple, we see that John and Deja have bonded because they have a common enemy and a common goal, not because they caught each other sneaking peeks like nine-year-olds. They go into the Thern Temple, deep in Warhoon territory, and find out about the Ninth Ray and how the medallion transported John to Mars. But now that John knows how to get home, he has to decide whether he wants to or not. But that decision gets put on hold because the Warhoons have found them trespassing in their temple and they are pissed. John sends Deja away with Sola as he stays to give them a chance to escape. John fights a gruesome and bloody battle with the Warhoons. And that's all that happens. The Warhoon battle scene in the released film was a mess. On one hand, the fate of John's family is revealed, but it's difficult to digest with such a large action sequence going on. And on the other, Getting all that plot information takes away from the visceral thrill of the fight. Trying to do both at once managed to take away the impact of both. In addition, Matai Shang's motivation for sending the Warhoons after them in the original movie was convoluted at best. In this version, Matai Shang is just cleaning up Sab Than's mistake, trying to eliminate anyone else who knows about the Ninth Ray. The fight ends with John escaping the Warhoons, only to get captured by the Zodangans, not the Heliumites. John uses his super strength to break out of his cell, and while looking for a way off the ship, he overhears Sab Than talking to Matai Shang. Shang is angry that Sola and Deja have been rescued by Helium, and now there's no telling who Deja has told about the Ninth Ray. Matai Shang does damage control and tells Sab Than that he will offer a truce in the form of a wedding. Once Odanga has the entire royal family of Helium in their city, they can kill all of them in one attack. Then Sab Than asks why they picked up John. Matai Shang tells him that the Earthman has found something of his, implying the medallion, and he wants to know where it is. 
John eventually escapes using one of the flyers. He flies to Thark and meets with Tars, who is now the Jeddak, having challenged and killed Tal Hajjus. Tars asks about Sola, and John tells him about her rescue by Helium and the danger she's in from Zodanga. Grateful to John and fearful for his daughter, Tars rallies all of the tribes of Thark together with the promise of looting Zodanga and saving the Heliumites. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sabthan arrives in Helium and proposes marriage to Deja. At first, her father, Tardos Mors, rejects the idea, saying that he'll never let his daughter marry a savage like Sab Than. But it's Deja that says enough good people have died in their feud, implying John's sacrifice. And if this is what it takes to make peace for their people, then so be it. Hollywood, I understand you want to have a strong female character, and that's great. But instead of giving Deja a throwaway line about how John should fight behind her, Instead, show her making a real sacrifice that she selflessly makes, knowing what it'll cost her. That's how you make a strong character, female or not. So, the royal family of Helium has no choice but to agree to the marriage, and they head for Zodanga. The wedding scene plays out pretty much the same, with John crashing the party to warn everybody of Zodanga's ambush. The Zodangans attack, and the Heliumites take heavy losses. But the Tharks arrive and provide much-needed reinforcements. Sab Than takes Deja hostage in the confusion and tries to escape. With John in hot pursuit, Sab Than calls out to Matai Shang, but Shang abandons him for his failure. John catches up and they have an intense, bloody duel, with John narrowly killing Sab Than. Afterward, we have an Episode 1 style unity celebration with the Tharks and Helium now officially allies, and John and Deja get together. Later that night, John wakes up and catches Matai Shang trying to take back the medallion, and John gets sent back to Earth. And from there, the rest of the movie plays out just like the released version. Edgar goes to the crypt, John kills the Thurned, and then uses the medallion to go back to his beloved Red Planet. So, that's how I would fix 2012's John Carter. Are there any movies that you think are in need of repair? If so, email me at the link down below or post a comment. And remember to click like and subscribe if you want to see more movies get fixed. Until next time, I'm Mr. Fixit for Fix the Flick.